Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Sebastian Jubo. Uh, I'm research director at a company called Xantella and today I'm going to talk to you about the valorization of molecules from seaweed and microalgae. I will start with a short introduction of my company. So Xantella, we are a small company based in uh, Auburn on the west coast of Scotland. We design and manufacture photobioreactors, so system to grow a microalgae from a lab scale to an industrial scale. Uh, and our aim is really to provide integrated and cost-effective effective system to help make industrial photobiology a reality. We also have a consultancy activity on microalgae production and valorization. Our main system is what we call the Micropharos. So it's a small photobioreactor for lab scale experiment. It's composed of two culture tanks, perfectly controlled, so you can control all the culture parameters like the pH, temperatures, the light cycle, the light intensity, and it's affordable actually. It's one of the cheapest systems on the market, so it's perfect uh, to speed up your research if you need to buy multiple systems. So that's our lab bench uh, photobiorec. We also have an industrial scale one, we call it the Pandora. So as you can see, it's a one cubic meter GRP tank with a high productivity because we are using um, submerged light tiles with LED. So of course here we are thinking in a context of Scotland, we don't have as much sun as in Colombia, but we have a lot of renewable energy available. So we are using this green renewable energy to power our system and to make top quality biomass. So stop talking about my company. Now let's focus on the algae market. Um, so if we have a look at the current algae market, when we say, of course, algae, we can't differentiate the seaweeds so or the macroalgae and the microalgae, the small one. In terms of uh, turnover, if we compare the turnover for both uh, markets, you can see that the seaweed market is a huge market, more than 10 billion uh, euro per year compared to around 2.6 billion for the microalgae. In terms of production, there's a lot of um, seaweed produced and used every year, so they can be uh, produced, but they can be also harvested in the wild. So you can see the difference between seaweed and microalgae, a huge difference between both of them. Um, as I said, seaweed is a huge industry, providing jobs to many, many people. Uh, microalgae, not as many people. Now, if we look at the, the species produced for the seaweed, you have a list here of the main uh, produced and uh, used species. Um, so Saccharina japonica is the most produced one. And if we have a look at the application, you can see here that Saccharina japonica, Euchema, Gracilaria, Capaficus, Lesonia, Sargassum, Ascophyllum, Macrocystis, Sargotalia, and Gelidium are used for the production of fico colloids. We'll talk about that just late, later. So to extract some molecule of interest while Undaya pinatifida and porphyra are mainly used as a food. So mainly consumed in Asia, but you might have um, consumed some porphyra with your sushi, for example. If we have a look at the microalgae in terms of production, we have Arthrospira, Platensis and Chlorella that are the two top uh, microalgae produced. They are really used as a food supplement, but there's also Afanisomenon, uh, Flos aquae, Matococcus pluvialis, Cryptocodinium and Feodactylum. All of these are used as a food supplement. Arthrospira, Platensis and Chlorella, is, uh, they, both are, they are both used uh, raw, so it's just powder. You can find powder for both of them, so it's a whole biomass. The same for Afaminism and Amphlos aquae, while Hematococcus, Cryptocodinium and Feodactylum, they are more produced for specific high-value molecules. So it's not the, the whole biomass that you are using, but most of the time extract. Um, Dunadiella is used for the production of beth, um, beta-carotene. Nostoc is used as a food 
uh, in Asia, your glena can be used also for food, but also for the production of biodiesel, nanochloropsis for um, the aquaculture purposes mainly. Um, for, for the microalgae, it's difficult to have a good overview of the global production because there's a lot of microalgae produced for aquaculture purposes, especially in hatchery. So if you want to, uh, to, to produce small fishes or shellfish larvae uh, and stuff like that, you need to, to feed them with fresh microalgae, living microalgae. So these companies they have their own production facility, but it's very difficult to get the data. So let's move to the first type of high value molecule. The first one is the polysaccharides. So polysaccharides is a polymer, it's a, it's a sugar polymer basically. So if we look at the seaweed hydrocolloid, um, as I explained before, that's really the main application for the seaweed. Um, there's basically three different types of polysaccharides, the carrageenan, the alginates, and the agar-agar. And here in these tables, you have the list of the seaweed source and the type of polysaccharides that they are producing and also the application. So if we look here, for example, at the carrageenan, uh, the carrageenan is produced by a different type of, of uh, seaweed, but they are not exactly the same molecules as the kappa carrageenan, the iota carrageenan, the lambda carrageenan, for example. One that is pr uh, produced a lot in, uh, in tropical countries, kappa ficus alvarezi, you can see it here. So that's a, that's a red alga. In fact, you can't really tell by here by the color, but the color will vary depending on the culture condition. But that's a red alga. Uh, so kappa ficus producing carrageenan, as I said, gelidium spinosum is one used here to produce agar. Um, so agar, you know the agar, you use it when you're doing some agar plate in microbiology. It's extracted from another red alga. And then we have the alginate. Alginate, most of them are extracted from seaweeds that we call kelp. So kelp is basically all the all the laminaria type uh, microalgae uh, seaweed. Sorry, and here you have an example of of Saccharina japonica that is produced in Asia and is used to to extract the the alginate. And you can see that depending on the molecules that you are producing here, you won't have the same properties here. Okay, so not the same application for each uh, molecules. Nevertheless, there's a huge range of application for this type of molecules. Food industry is a, is a very large market, so you can find all the uh, seaweed hydrocolloid uh, under the reference E400 to E407. And they are used in ice cream, in, in pastry, as an emulsifier, lubricant, in diet products. So you, you can have a look at the composition of your food product. You will probably see and find some seaweed extract. They are also used in cosmetic and, and pharmacy to the, as a sickening agent for cream, toothpaste, syrup, compress, or the biomaterial. If you need to have a surgery, for example, they can build some biomaterial with, uh, with seaweed uh, hydrocolloids. Other application in textile industry, paper industry, as a water treatment too. And we estimate that the, the global market really for the, the hydrocolloid here is not as a, as a food just for the, the hydrocolloid application is estimated that will be $2.4 billion by 2024. You can see here the average retail price. So that's really the average price. You can see it's not that high in terms of uh, price per kilo, but of course it will vary depending on the application. If you go for some very specific application like a biomaterial for surgery, like I was explaining before, the price will increase because the specification of, pr of the product will be different. Let's talk about another polysaccharides with great value. It's uh, the fucoidan. So for the fucoidan is a sulfated polysaccharide. It's a polymer of fucose. You can see here the structure. Um, originally, it was extracted from uh, a brown alga called Fucus vesiculosus. You can see it here, but it's found in, in many brown algae. So the name is coming, of course, fucoidan from the fucus. 
it has been uh, specifically uh, studied because um, it's highly consumed. Brown, brown seaweed are highly consumed in Okinawa in Japan and uh, the people there live more years than the other people even in Japan and they correlated that by to their consumption of brown algae and especially of, of fucoidan. Um, there's a large range of biological activities that has been tested in vitro. You, can, you have the list here, antioxidant, anti-tumor, for example, anti-inflammatory, but all of them are, as I said, tested in vitro. But there's also some potential therapeutic activity uh, tested both in vitro and in vivo, like anti-cancer, uh, antiviral, like for influenza A and hepatitis B, uh, and for the control of uh, diabetic and metabolic syndrome. Nevertheless, today the main application for the fucoidan, so you extract the fucoidan is as a food supplement, and the claims on the products you can find in the market is that it's good for your immune system, for your cardiovascular, skin and joint health, also for your digestive health. And the price is quite high. If you have a look at this type of product, you just have few grams of fucoidan and the average price is around $6,000 uh, per kilo. So quite a, a, a nice product with a nice uh, added value. Another polysaccharides, it's an exopolysaccharide from porphyridium. So porphyridium is a, is a small uh, microalga, it's a seawater red alga. I, I, I really love this one because I made my PhD on this one and it produces plenty of very interesting molecules. So here we'll just focus on the exopolysaccharides. So you can see the cell are quite small, around 10 micrometers in diameter and uh, they are producing two fractions of exopolysaccharide. One is soluble, so you can see it, it's, it's, it's in the culture medium, so it's, it's solubilized into the culture medium, and the other fraction is bound to the cells, and that's what you can see here around all the cells. Um, so, so that's the, the, the bound fraction of the exopolysaccharides, and that's a protection for the cells because it will maintain, uh, it will prevent the dehydration of the cells, it will uh, keep some nutrient inside the gel, so it's, uh, it, it protects the cells against shear stress, so that's a, a very effective way to, to protect the cells. So if you have a, one day a culture of porphyridium, you forget it in the back of your incubator, it will last for ages because of these exopolysaccharides. Uh, in terms of structure, that's a quite a, a big polysaccharide between 2,000 and 7,000 kilodalton. We, we don't really know yet the, the, the real structure because it's very complex. We know that the three main sugar are xylose, galactose and glucose and that the percentage of, of uh, sulfatation is around between 3 and 10%. In terms of properties and potential applications, so like the, the hydrocolloid from seaweed, it has some texturing property. So at low concentration, the rheological behavior is quite similar to the one of the xanthan. Um, you can make some very stable gels uh, at a large range of pH, salinity and temperature, so potential application for food, even pet food. It has some antioxidant properties. It has very interesting lubricant uh, also properties, better than the hyaluronic acid. So all that makes that it can be used as a cosmetic for cosmetic application. It also has some antiviral properties, so potential application in the pharmaceutic market. And it can capture metallic iron, so potential application for bioremediation and, and water treatment, for example. That's all the different properties, but the application today remains uh, the, the cosmetic market. So there are companies that are selling uh, exopolysaccharides from porphyridium as a cosmetic ingredient. So the first product is Lidin from a green tech French company. And here I just take what they are claiming about their product. So good for the correction of skin blemishes and redness, perfect for sensitive skin. skin and it also have an anti-heavy leg and it's toning. So, okay, so that's all what they are claiming about their products. I took the picture from their website because I love the, the cosmetic, how they talk to the customer, so see the difference with and without. Another product, uh, another cosmetic ingredient based on the Porphyridium uh, EPS is Hydrantance from Givaudan, another French company. 
and here you see the claim are quite different. Here it's all about hydration, uh, increase the water content of the strato stratum corneum. So stratum corneum is a layer of the of the skin. It improves in uh, skin micro relief. So see, it's, it's definitely not the same thing as the, the, the product from Green Tech. Here they are communicating about the water, and that's a picture from their website, just water hydration. So last product, but I'm not sure that it still produces Algard from Fruit Arome, so an Israeli company, and here, see the list, plenty of stuff, basically all the list of what, what I told you before. Okay, they are claiming everything, but I think the product is, is not available on the market uh, anymore. The average price for this type of product is around $1,000 per kilo, and the global production m must be yeah less than 100 a kilo per year i think so that was all about um a polysaccharides of course there, there are other polysaccharides of interest but here I'm, I'm going quite quickly you can have some ulvan from uh, green seaweed for example that have other potential interest but i just selected a um, few of them to show you the differences um, so now let's talk about uh, another type of molecules, the pigments. So the pigments, you know that, you know, or maybe you don't know, but I guess you know, uh, that the algae are classified based on their color. So you can find the red algae. So on this slide, I focus on the microalgae. Uh, Porphyridium crantum, so it's a red alga. Here, Cylindroteca clostrium is a brown alga, especially it's a diatom, this one. Tetracelmis suecica, it's a green al alga, you can tell it. And in the algae classification, some people are also adding the, the blue-green algae, also called cyanobacteria, like Arthrospira platensis or the spirulina. If we have a look at the seaweed, seaweed, we have uh, red seaweed, so palmaya palmata is a red seaweed, ascophyllum nodosum is a brown seaweed, ulva americana is a green seaweed, but for the seaweed there's no blue-green seaweed. Blue-green blue algae are really cyanobacteria and they are all uh, microscopic, so there's no large blue-green seaweed. So of course, this uh, the color of the algae is linked to the production of pigment. And I will show you the different pigments that are produced and how we can valorize them. I won't focus on the green one because green one is like for the higher plant, it's, it's chlorophyll, you know, all these organisms are photosynthetical, so they are producing chlorophyll, but there's no specific interest of this chlorophyll compared to uh, chlorophyll from higher plants, so I won't talk about that. So I will start with astaxanthin, so red cells to pick salmons, I will explain that why. So astaxanthin, um, it's from many different, many different uh, species of algae, but at uh, industrial scale we are using Hematococcus pluvialis. So if you have a look at Hematococcus pluvialis here, you will tell me, oh, come on, that's, uh, that it looks really green. So it's not a pigment from a red alga. No, in fact, you're, you're totally right. Hematococcus pluvialis is a green alga, but when it is stressed, it turns red. You see a very bright red. So if you, for example, if there's a nitrogen starvation in your culture medium, or too much light to uh, the, the algae will turn into this red phase to protect itself. Uh, and these type of algae produced in like astaxanthin are eaten by uh, small shrimps or krill. That's why you can see the color of the krill is quite, they have dots, uh, orange dot, orange or red dots. And if you ever used um, krill oil, you'll see that it has a, a quite a, a red color, strong red color. And these shrimp and krill, they are eaten by salmon, and that's why the, the meat of the salmon is orange, pink orange. Uh, so that's the cycle in the nature. The, the, the pigment by itself, so astaxanthin is a carotenoid. Here you have the structure. It's, it's really, really red when you extract it. Here are a few extracts that I uh, made a few years ago, and it, it's really, really red. 
it's one of the most powerful antioxidants that you can find it is sold as a, as a food supplement in capsule like that at a quite uh, high price uh, the average selling price vary between uh, 12,000 and 50,000 dollar per kilo the estimated global production is between 15 and and, and uh, 18 ton per year so here i'm talking in terms of pure of course of course astaxanthin uh, with a global market around uh, three uh, 300 million uh, dollar the main producers here you have a list of the main producers so algatech based in israel algalif uh, based in um, uh, iceland cyanotech in hawaii bgg in china and astariel in uh, in japan so let's move to another pigment a blue pigment this time so phycocyanin phycocyanin so it's really the blue pigment that you will find in in red algae but also in cyanobacteria because and it, 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 uh, the, the phycocyanin is part of what we call the phycobilisome so phycobilisome here it's this structure that you will find on the thylakoid membrane and uh, it's uh, it, what it does basically it harvests the light and brings the light to the uh, chlorophyll for the photosynthetic activity so the phycobilisome is composed most of the time of uh, phycoerythrin here so in, in in pink phycocyanin in dark blue and allo phycocyanin in clear blue so the proportion of each pigment will vary depending if you are working with red algae or cyanobacteria the structure of the phycocyanin is uh, so it's a, it's a proteic pigment with some here uh, a group that we call a bilin group that gives the color of the whole molecule okay so that's a but that's a protein and it has a very nice blue color and it fluoresces into uh, the purple so very nice color and you can see here that when you put it yeah if you stress this with some uv light you will get this type of color uh, it has plenty of different activities the phycobili protein especially the the phycocyanin protection of the liver um, it's a very good antioxidant some anti-inflammatory properties and many others that has been described into the literature but the real uh, market for the phycocyanin is that it's the only natural blue water soluble uh, and fda approved pigment uh, so it's it is used you know in a for example here in the smarties the, the blue coating here is made with with phycocyanin you can use it since it's water soluble for for make some uh, some ice cream for example it is sold so as a, as a colorant for food and for the cosmetic industry you can find it in in powder or in tablet like that some people are also uh, selling it as a food supplement in liquid form in liquid form so you don't have dehydration so it, it preserve all the activity of the molecule the selling price will will vary depending on the application if you have a powder like that the the selling price will be quite low while if you are working with a stabilized product in liquid form here the price will be quite high um, so it varies a lot the estimated global production is around 600 ton um, with a global market of 20 million dollar estimation but with a very high gross 12 uh, percent CAGR and most of the time this uh, phycocyanin is extracted from the spiri spirulina so arthrospira platensis um, it is growing in uh, many different places you have huge uh, production site in Southeast, Southeast Asia, for example, but in Hawaii too. Uh, the issue is that these molecules, as I told you, it's, it's a protein, so it's quite sensitive to dehydration, sensitive to pH, and sensitive to temperature. So it limits the application of this product. That's why some people are working with other uh, cyanobacteria, like Galderia sulfuraria, so it's an extremophile that is growing in uh, hydrothermal spring with high sulfur content so it can survive in pH close to uh, 2 with high temperature around 50-60 degrees 
and there's a company called Fairmont Algin Friends that is working on on the production of this specific strain to extract a phycocyanin that is less sensitive, especially to pH its temperature. So it gives potential more application, but it's the product is not yet on the market. Let's talk about now the, the phycoerythrin. So phycoerythrin is basically the same as a phycocyanin, but pink. So I explain you the structure of the phycobilisome, remember, and uh, in the in the red algae the phycobilisome is mainly composed of phycoerythrin so you can have it from um, from microalgae here again porphyridium cruentum but also from other uh, seaweed i extracted in the past uh, phycoerythrin from gatulupia turuturi for example a, a seaweed and you get this nice extract so here it's a more pink extract compared to phycocyanin that were that was blue and the fluorescence is in the orange so very nice color too um, we don't get exactly the same molecule when you are working with uh, microalgae and seaweed so with microalgae we get b phycoerythrin and with seaweed we, we get r phycoerythrin it's not up authorized in food yet, so there's no application in food like for the phycocyanin. The main application is as a, as a fluorescent probe, so if you couple that with antibodies, you know, you can target and, um, and see really the, the target because it fluoresces. Uh, so for more biochemical application, biological application, the average selling price because for this application they are working with very pure phycoerythrin is quite high it's around 50,000 uh, pounds per kilo but the global market is very low it might be a few few dozens of kilogram per year uh, so small market but with very high uh, very high price What's interesting to see is that um, they don't have, as I said, even if we are talking about phycoerythrin, they don't, they are not exactly the same molecule if you're working with R phycoerythrin from seaweed or B phycoerythrin from microalgae. You can see here the absorption spectrum of the RPE and here the absorption spectrum of BPE. You can see that the spectrum is not, has not the same shape so not really the same property in terms of light absorption. In terms of stability, it's not exactly the same too. Here, so on, on this line here, it's the evolution of the spectrum based on the, uh, on, on the pH. So you can see that the, the RPE is quite stable, even, of, even uh, at low pH, you can see here that the peak are more or less maintained at pH two, while for the BPE here at pH two, you lose all the uh, optical properties, so the molecule is totally destroyed. Um, but if not, it's, it's quite stable between pH three and let's say let's say pH nine. After that, above pH nine, you start losing the property of the molecule. And the same thing for here, the the temperature the at forty degrees here in blue, you can see that the BPA is quite more stable than the RP for the same temperature. So you need to know all that, what, uh, what, is, what is the sensitivity of the molecule when you want to uh, target some specific market. So we did green, uh, we did, sorry, blue, we did red, uh, we did pink. So now let's go for the fucoxanthin. So fucoxanthin from uh, brown algae. So that's a carotenoid again uh, but this one is brown so it gi gives a color to the brown algae that's the main uh, the main pigment you can find it in many different brown algae because it gives it it, it gives them their, their color so the the seaweed with the highest content in fucoxanthin is a sargassum you can see here 3.7 milligram per gram uh, more or less it's not huge but the, the nice thing with sargassum is, you know, there's plenty of biomass available because of the bloom of sargassum that you can get in, in Caribbean Sea, for example. So there's plenty of resource. If we compare that with the microalgae sources, you see here the content of the microalgae is way higher. Okay, it's, it's, it's almost 10 times higher uh, than the average. Uh, concentration in seaweed sources, so very interesting to work with with microalgae. Um, 
it has again you know people are testing a lot of, of biological activities tested in vitro and here you have a, a list of what has been found anti-cancer anti-diabetes anti-obesity etc but the main application is really uh, as a food supplement so if people if you want to lose weight or manage your weight uh, take some some fucoxantin that's what people say at least and uh, if we look at few uh, products available on the market here you can we, we compare the, the the source so here some people are working of Undaya pinatifida so that's this uh, seaweed laminaria another seaweed here sometimes they don't really say it's a brown seaweed so you know they collect brown seaweed and they extract the fucoxantin and a few companies so uh, two company an israel and one and uh, a french one are working with pheodactylum triconutum so this uh, this microalga the average selling price is around two hundred dollar per kilo with an estimated global production of around 500 ton so a global market of around 120 million dollar with quite a, a, a nice growth around five percent growth so an interesting product so that was it for this uh, brief introduction of all the interesting molecules that you can find in the in the algae of course there's a huge potential that is not fully exploited um, there's a huge biodiversity for both uh, seaweed and microalgae they are very good at co2 capture for example they are very rich in protein so it's a good alternative source of, of protein they could be used as a, as a biomaterial so yeah plenty of other application uh, i'll be happy to answer any question so um, yeah if here are my contact details if you have any question or if you want to collaborate on some project thank you very much for your attention and have a good day